You're listening to a sermon originally recorded by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this sermon blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for listening. Now, on to the message. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, that's great. I needed to turn it on. I just got to say, as I, as I get up here, it's such a joy uh, to see your faces enter into worship, uh, responding to Pastor Jason's uh, uh, challenge for us to sing loudly, to watch these guys bring the joy that they have in giving their gifts to the Lord, um, to see this place is fully alive in all generations. I mean, what a great gift. Uh, we have from God, and it is good to be here. Well, this morning, we, we continue our series on the Psalms. And for me, this has been uh, not, not a complete wake up, but a, a, a reinvigoration, if you will, for these great uh, pieces of scripture, uh, literature, poetry, that are really expressions of praise and worship and confession to God. And so this morning, we're going to dive into, as Pastor Jason said, into to, uh, Psalm 32. Before we do that, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have had uh, those light bulb moments in life where the light bulb goes on? All right. Yeah, quite a few of you. Yeah, it's that, it's that time where, where, where something was unclear and suddenly it becomes clear. It's a time of inspiration. Or you didn't understand something and suddenly you do. And it's good. And some examples, some examples might be, uh, well, let me just ask you. I saw a number of hands. What might be a light bulb moment for you? Anybody want to shout one out? <laughs> I thought it had to do with a tractor, you know, because it's, it's Pastor Jason, right? So it's, difference is not deficient. Out of the, I don't know, out of the beach came that voice. I don't know. So... Uh, thank you, back there. Uh, yeah, and so f for me, it's things like, um, well, the first time I held a baby, especially my baby, one of my sons, it was like I knew how precious life was. I knew that it is a miracle, life. Might be the first time that we are able to ride a bike. I mean, to really ride it, and it... It's that paradox between, you know, you need speed to get going, but you're a little afraid of speed, but suddenly, you know it's there. And now for all the uh, baseball and softball players out there, how many of you are baseball and softball players? Okay, a few. So I got, you know, I got to give you a shout out. So it's, uh, it's that first time that, and I did try this uh, with a baseball team the other day, and they got it. Uh, and so it's that first time you're able to take that outside pitch to right field. 
You know, people tell you you can do it, but it's really hard because you want to pull it and step into it. And so when you do it, it's like, oh my gosh, I figured it out. I can do that again. And lastly, for the pickleball players out there, it's finally, and I know there's a lot of you, you know, come back to pickleball here. I'm going to leave Panera out today, but I am going to touch on pickleball. The, uh, uh, so th- but pickleball is when you finally figure out, when you finally figure out, it keeps score. And I'll just leave it there. For any of you who, who've played that, yeah, I hear a few laughs because it is, it is a light bulb moment. So we have some fun with that. But I will tell you that a light bulb came on for me about 25 years ago when I when I opened this book and this, this book, the Holy Scripture, and I turned to the middle of the book and to these, and I didn't really even know what I was turning into because I hadn't really read Scripture. And so I turned into the Psalms and into Proverbs, and it was like a light bulb came on for me. It was, it was speaking to me that this is the truth. This book is the truth. It was just as if the spirit of this book was testifying, speaking to the spirit in me. It was, it was this, I had lived long enough, enough to know that the confessions in this book were true, true to my heart. That the wisdom in this book was true to what I was finding out and experiencing in life. And for example, in Proverbs 12, 18, these words, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Yeah, we know that, but we have to hear it. We have to own it. And then from Psalm 69, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. In my times of trouble, I needed to hear those words and express those words. The Psalms gave me permission, as we've talked about in this series, gave me permission to say what I didn't think I could say or how to express it because I didn't uh, know what it was like to really be a person of faith. I was hinging in that religious stuff and I didn't know what I could say to God and what I couldn't. But the Psalms tell us, they speak for us as to how we can be honest with God. And so this book, this very one, is the, my very first Bible that I bought after I had read the wisdom literature, as it's called. In the middle of the Bible, there's five, five books in there. They're called the wisdom literature. I read this. I went to the store. Trying to pick out a Bible is interesting for me. That's a story for another day. But uh, this is the one I bought. And I began to work this thing. I mean, I began to read it write uh, in it, highlight it, put paper clips in it, put papers in it. Yeah, that's just an example. Now, how many of you write in your books and Bibles? Yeah, there are some of us. All right, yeah, quite a few actually. For us, reading and reading Scripture is a physical exercise. Now, today we're going to dive into to Psalm 32. And Psalm 32 um, is really, it's a work of David. It's thought to be a work of King David. And it is, uh, an, again, an expression of his heart, really the human condition. And we are going to look at what David was going through in his life. So for those of us, for a little context, David lived about a thousand years before Christ. And for me, he's a biblical character that's really kind of unmatched for his depth, if you will, for his adversity, <laughs> creating it, living through it, also his love of God. His, um, his failings. When I first read David, that David had written these, I mean, it's like they would put this honest of, of stories into a book because David, as we know, he was rich, he was poor, but he was a man who loved God, but was he flawed? And so in that, we can see ourselves. So I'm going to read for you like uh, Jason did when we had, had the prayer time, he had said Selah, and Selah is thought to mean a time of pause and reflection. So as I read Psalm 32 to us, I'm going to uh, say Selah, and that means we'll give us some time to reflect and to think. All right? Here we go. Blessed, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count, count against them, and then whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let all the faithful, all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you have Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Well, David begins with the word blessed. So what does blessed really mean? Well, the author and pastor James Bryan Smith, he gives us this definition, which I think is really true. Blessed is more than happy. It means truly well off or for those whom everything is good. Blessed is a religious word to many of us today and, and is associated with being pious. Happy refers to a temporary condition based on externals. It denotes a more shallow state of being. Today, the most accurate translation might be well off. Well, David, in addition to starting with blessed, speaks directly to sin and what sin does to us. And so these are on opposite ends. And sin creates brokenness. It, sin, it creates inside of us a, a state of being that is not well off. David speaks from experience that we can have all kinds, because he's a king, that he can have all kinds of wealth and inside that we can be in despair. David knows that we can have shiny things, all kinds of possessions again, things that make us look good on the outside and yet on the inside, a relationship with God and others is broken. Again, internally, we can be in despair. You see, David was a king living in sin, living in deceit, half-truths and lies, and he thought that he had covered up his sin. And sin being really, he's, he's missed the mark. A definition for sin is really he missed the mark for what God has for us, what God intends for us, what God seeks and desires. God was seeking a king, a leader, that could lead his people really in healthy and good ways. And transgressions meaning disobedience. Well, he had, David had, uh, had committed adultery, and he was covering it up, and he had hurt many people. And then a prophet came to, to David, Nathan, and confronted him. And it's when he confronted David that David confessed his sin. And it was in this confession, this time of confession, that there's an opening. Confession creates an opening into a new life, a clean slate. And so this is what comes for David. He will suffer consequences. We suffer consequences for the times that we really mess up. 
But David now can begin a new life with God. God is remaking David. God's power is demonstrated in forgiving David and giving him a new life. Well, now let's hear verses 3, 4, and 5 again. I'll repeat these. When I kept silent, excuse me, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. So the psalmist here is really speaking to the complexities that we are as human beings. That the, uh, the state of our spiritual life expect, ex- impacts our physical and emotional state of living. When David was silent, his bones wasted away. I experienced this phenomenon about, oh, about 13 years ago when I was uh, working with a colleague who I respected and admired greatly, brilliant guy, a a man of real faith, a man of real faith. And he, um, he began losing weight. And he had some weight to lose, you know, if, if you will. And so at first, people thought it was just intentional, and people thought, well, he might be going to Weight Watchers or something. And then over time, he began to lose more weight. And people started talking, well, maybe he's really sick, you know, he has cancer or something like that. And it was about this time that I was going through training, Stephen ministry training, and I didn't know that God would would use me in this way, but I think that's how God works. And so I, I really love this guy, and again, a great colleague, And so one day, I'd come past the point knowing that faith is private, although it may be personal, we're supposed to care for each other. And so I said these words to him, I'm concerned about you, is there anything I can pray for you about? And those are words that I found out are words of real power, because they give people the permission to express what's going on in their lives in ways that honors them. And so there was a long pause. It, uh, at least it seemed that way. It was probably only a few seconds, maybe seven or eight. And then he, he confessed. Not that that was my intent. Again, I just, I said, I want is there anything I can pray for you about? And he said, yeah, I've really messed up. I've had an affair and my marriage is ending. And I'm really needing prayer and I'm needing to, uh, to talk about this and This seems like a safe place, and it was. And so over time, we began to pray together and pray for him and for his family. And it began to be, for me, it gave me an impression. Really, really it gave me more than an impression. It spoke to me the truth of being righteous. The truth of being righteous is not keeping all the religious rules. The truth of being righteous is being honest with God, and being open with God, and to seek God's healing. And over time, as we talked and we prayed, he became, in God's power, he became more healthy again. And he sought what God would do with the next part of his life. And so he left, eventually he left this area and began a new life, if you will. And I checked in with him. One of the real great benefits of Facebook is you can check in with people. You know, you can find them. They're out there. When you need to talk to them, want to talk to them, you do. I checked in with him last week. And although he, again, lives with the consequences of, the, of how he messed up, his life is restored. He's reconciled to God, and he's doing well. And so for me, part of, part of what people need in life is a safe place to really talk about what is going on in our lives. And God will use us in ways that we can't begin to imagine. Being righteous is being open and humble and honest with God, trusting God. Now, the act of confession and receiving forgiveness in our uh, Catholic brothers and sisters, they uh, practice this as a sacrament. And one of the things that in my research, and we kind of know this, but it helps us to to revisit it, what what confession does to us is at at least these five things. First, it's housekeeping for the soul. 
Isn't it good to get out the clutter that is within us, to be able to express it, to have a clean room and house, if you will? It gives us a lightness as human beings that we desire. Confession also is a bomb for the desire for revenge. In other words, it's like an ointment that begins to heal us and does not uh, takes away the desire to want to get revenge. If we can receive forgiveness from Christ, we can then begin to forgive others. It begins with us and then is extended to others. And forgiveness or confession, I mean, confession is really a forced time to think. It's in this frenetic culture, I believe, that we need more forced time to think and to really examine our lives. What's going on with our lives? Why do we feel such a dis? dis-, dis- equilibrium sometimes, that we feel fragmented. For me, it's, it's a forced time of confession that I can think about it and then I can give it to God and to begin to feel right with God. Confession also gives us a realistic self-perception. In other words, if we have a tendency to be arrogant or full of pride, confession can fix that for us because we're a sinner just like everybody else. And then there is a closeness in confession that we get with God. It's, simp- it's an expression. We feel safe. We feel like we can give it to God. And God comes close and begins to make us new again. What can be better than to know that God is with us and for us? Well, if confession, in, these, in this modern context, if confession, receiving forgiveness, and prayer, in verse 6 and 7, it really talks to the power of prayer. If those are so important in the vital life to, main, to keep us vital in our faith life that affects every other part of our life, how do we do that in our modern context? Well, for me, one of the primary ways that I've found that is very beneficial is what we call the band. And we've talked about that some here at Schweitzer, but we continue to form these groups. And I belong to other groups too, and they are great. But a band is unique. It's both, so let me just describe it. A band is both for women and men, and it's by gender. It's usually three to five people, and we meet for times of confession. And, well, I think I have a picture up here. Yeah. And this is a picture of where I meet with the band, and it's in the prayer room. You can do it any, you know, you can meet anywhere, but we meet in confidentiality. We face each other. We confess. We're confidential. We also laugh. We enjoy each other because we trust each other, and we know we've come to know each other deeply. And so I want to share with you what they have to say. It's one thing for me to say it. It's another thing to hear it from people who are experiencing a band. First, having a safe place where one can dump the garbage in one's life, stuff that is secret and shameful, is liberating. It frees you to own it, seek forgiveness, and replace sin with virtue. This is what my band of brothers gives to me. And then from another Uh, guy in the band. We learn to confess in our private prayers to God, and here he means kind of generally. As followers of Christ, we learn to confess privately to God. Because we are never sinless, our heads and bodies can become bowed in shame, as if we're the only child of God, as incomplete as we might feel. Confession is the, in the trusted setting of the band creates, in Richard Rohr's words, a human mirror to reflect the unseeable divine gaze. For all in the band have sinned, and God grants the authority to forgive and stop holding sin against oneself or another. So we, as Jesus tells us in the Scriptures, we have the power, and we're expected to forgive each other, and we give each other absolution. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven as we talk about our sins. And so for me, this is what... This is what a band does, and a place of confession. I come out of there every week, so we meet weekly. I come out of there every week feeling lighter, feeling that God has my back, feeling like I have been in a place that God has surrounded me. The Psalm talks about that. I feel protected. I feel like I'm more available to other people. When Jesus says, be the light of the world, that I can be a light, that I can give hope, because I've just experienced it, that I can give prayer, that I can give to others what I didn't have in me when I went into that experience. And mentally, the thing that I uh, feel like that I confess 
is that there's, am I putting God first in my life? And so for me, uh, all of us can benefit. Whoop, don't want to trip over and go into the sea here. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, but this confession, I mean, it changes us. And it's such a part of Scripture that we can enter into. And I feel like, and I think I mentioned it, a, a better neighbor. Because the transformation of our souls is not just for ourselves, right? Jesus wants us to be able to transform the world. And so it's really for others. And now I want to give you a quick invitation to the band experience. Pastor Jake leads our band ministry here. Next Sunday, this isn't in your bulletin, but you can sign up for it. So you still have your, we haven't had offering yet, so you still have your uh, connection cards. If you'll write on, on line number three on your card, there's a place there. You can come to this event where you can just try it on. You're not expected to join a band. Again, men or women, it will be any questions you might have. Come on in, ask them. We'll tell you more about it. Um, again, it's a safe, confidential, but just come and try it on. It's an on-ramp, so it's, and I didn't say when. So it's next Sunday, 1215, downstairs Memorial Hall, okay? Food, child care is available. Come and check out the band. And so as we've almost finished this psalm, verses 9 and 10 you can't make it up. Why does God have to include those lines about us being a mule or like a horse, you know, who's just stubborn? What's our capacity to be stubborn? I like to say strong-willed. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's really, no pun intended, unbridled. Um, I know for me, I, I'm, a, I'm a mule in the sense that, I mean, just, just, and again, just look at my life. I didn't turn to Scripture or to God really till I was in mid-30s, and I you know, I know God exists, and, but, you know, that's that. Thanks be to God. I didn't um, um, really believe, I didn't really, really believe that we needed corporate worship. I was stubborn in the point where Roxanne would go to worship and I would stay home. I was like, we don't really need that. And I can't believe that I was that stubborn and stupid. I mean, I can't believe what corporate worship does for us. I mean, this experience. So God, I think, keeps that, that puts that line in there to keep us honest with ourselves because we can deceive ourselves. And I can't tell you how much I look forward to Holy Communion now, and I learn through regular worship, the power of Holy Communion, where we can come up and confess our greed, our fear, whatever it is, that we can give it to God in Holy Communion. And so as we prepare to wrap this up today, I want to... I just want to say Psalm 32. If you take nothing else away, know that Psalm 32 is about the power of God, about the power of confession, forgiveness, and trusting God. And so as we prepare to go from this place today, well, it's also a witness. This is David's witness and invitation. So I want to pass along a witness and invitation to all of you. First, if you're needing prayer and needing confession in a private way, in a, in a unique way today. Stay behind, and Pastor Jason and I will be here, and we'll meet with you, and we'll pray with you, okay? Secondly, do try on that band experience. If you're at all thinking, I want to go deeper with people. I want to go to a place with God where I can learn to trust God in a new way and other people and see God in their face. Come to the band experience next Sunday, 1215, downstairs in Memorial Hall. I think you'll be blessed to have been there. And then third, I want you to tell your stories, the stories that you have with God, the power of God. Psalm 32 is at its essence, the story of the power of God. And so it's easy for me to say, hey, tell your stories without telling mine. And so I want to share one story with you from the power of God in my life. When I thought about this week, it was a time that I confessed to God deeply. And it was in, it was about, tw about that same time, about 13 years ago, 12, 13, that I was confessing to God that, that I'd really been disobedient to God. I'd had a call in my life to be in ministry for a while. And I tried to ignore that. <laughs> 
And I tried then, okay, I'll do it my way. I'll just do a little here. And I'll do a little there. I'll take a little step here. I'll take a little step there. And then Pastor Bob slid something across the table. Well, Panera is coming in. And we were at Panera with Pastor Bob. He slid across the table. He said, you might want to try this, Jim. You might want to try seminary. And so I did. But I, but I still didn't make a commitment to God the way God was calling me. And so for me, as Pastor Jason says, that everybody's a theologian, but also all places are sacred. There's a Pasta Express. How many of you know where Pasta Express is here? Yeah, a whole bunch of you. It's right over here uh, on Battlefield and, and 65. So I was sitting in Pasta Express, and I had confessed to God, and then I confessed to Roxanne. <laughs> so, well, that's, Roxanne's not God, but, you know, she's pretty much up. She's there. So I'm just, <laughs> thank you. Well, you, you tell her however you want to tell that story. So, uh, and I confessed to her, I was like, you know, I have got to give in to this call. And I have been disobedient. God, forgive me. Forgive me. And then I just started weeping. I just started weeping in the middle of Pasta Express. And a friend of mine started walking in the door and came running over and said, is everything okay? <laughs> and it was kind of comical. And we're like, yeah, it's good. I finally said, God, I'm all yours. Do what you will with me. And Roxanne said, it's good. God has you. I have you. Let's try this thing that's called vocational ministry. And so I'll tell you, when I finally confessed to God in a way that was real, my life has changed. And I have, as David would say, be blessed to not have the experience that I've had with all of you and my colleagues. And I look around this place today. I can't imagine life without it. And I can't imagine how much God has blessed me and will continue to bless all of us. And so as we go away from this place today, people of God, keep confessing, keep receiving forgiveness, then give that forgiveness away, forgive others, trust God, and let's be people of hope. Amen? Amen.